Well, I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, Harmon, great job with the song leading. Thank you. Steve, I just want, I want to go on record here. If I die young, 40-something, so I guess it's a little too late. If I die younger, um, I want Steve to lead a prayer at my funeral. You've all heard me say that. And Steve, I'll make sure you say in that prayer that I'm doing just fine. Maybe you've heard the old joke that somebody is trying to figure out God's will for their life, so they opened their Bible and said, Lord, tell me what I'm supposed to know, and opened to a random page and read, and it said, Judas went out and hung himself. And they said, that can't be right. So they closed their Bible and said, something else, Lord, and opened the Bible, and it said, and the Lord said, go and do likewise, right? (laughs) That kind of thing of piecing some stuff together, you know, we're not quite that bad, but I would say that Leviticus presents itself a problem in this area because we don't always know what to do with these texts and know how to apply them. Here are a couple of suggestions that have come up over the years. One is a theocratic theonomy view, and that is everything in Leviticus is supposed to be taken over into our lives in a one-to-one ratio. Whatever he said, that's what he wants for us today. And so you'll often get this from people who tend to think of their particular nation as if their nation is the new Israel of today. All the laws should be the same as the laws you get in Leviticus and so forth. This, this can be problematic on a number of levels. For example, a lot of people who, um, who think that way, I would have a problem, I think, with, for example, Deuteronomy 23, verses 19 through 20, that say, don't charge fellow Israelites any interest. So there can be no interest in your business dealings in that rule for locals. You can charge foreigners anything you want, the next verse says, but not fellow Israelites. This is an interesting one. Uh, In Deuteronomy 20, verses 19 through 20, it says, when you're waging war... Don't cut down any fruit trees. That's a really interesting one. Can you imagine as the general's getting everybody ready, telling them where they're going to go and what they're going to do? He says, oh, and by the way, no pruning. And then we have Leviticus 25. This one's a tough one for people who believe in sort of, you know, a fair market economy um, business practices. Leviticus 25, verse 23 says, you can't just buy and sell land. In fact, the land is supposed to stay in the family in perpetuity to take care of smaller family units. When Ahab offered money for Naboth's land, he was horrified. How dare you offer me money in exchange for goods? There's some problems with theocratic view, and I I wouldn't recommend that. And so the second view is, okay, it's not a one-to-one ratio. Maybe, maybe we're supposed to follow whatever is specifically re-mentioned in the New Testament. It's Old Testament, doesn't apply to us, the argument goes. But if it reappears in the New Testament, well, then that's law for the Christian. Problems with this view is that some New Testament passages that begin to list some of the laws look as if they're just naming some to represent the whole. James, for example, is trying to make the point that if you err in one small thing, it's like breaking the whole law. So he gives examples, and he names four or five of the Ten Commandments. And if you say, well, the four or five he mentions, those are in effect, but not the ones he doesn't. It looks as if he's naming a couple to represent all of them, as if, don't you get the idea? You break one, you break them all. There's a thing called metonymy, where one stands in the place of the whole. Paul doesn't seem to read the Old Testament that way. When Paul is writing and he says the law is holy and righteous and good, he doesn't say was holy and righteous and good. He says is holy and righteous and good. In Acts... Paul takes a Nazarite vow and shaves his head. And one of my favorite New Testament professors, I won't mention his name, who I I would follow into battle, actually says that Paul sinned in this verse because he went back to the old law. I don't believe that for a second. I think he still followed the law because he was a Jew and a Christian. 
And this idea that the only things that reappear in the New Testament are the things to follow is, is, a, is a strong line that doesn't seem to be represented there. So the third view is that maybe what we need is the ceremonial law versus the moral law. The ceremony stuff went out, but the moral stays. I like that a lot. But it's interesting when you get down to the nitty-gritty to figure out what falls under ceremony and what falls under moral. I don't know where the list is clearly laid out, and I know the people who hold this view disagree about what belongs in each view. So what's been most helpful to me, and this is not a full proof, but what's been most helpful to me is to say that all of this is local. Let me start with this general statement. None, none of Leviticus was written to me, but all of it was preserved for me. None of it was intended to be legislation for the church full stop. All of it tells me something about the heart of God, which is legislation for the church full stop. And under that understanding, this is all local, but it's rooted in who God is. It's a little bit like reading uh, journal entries written by your wife before she met you. And what she was saying about the other boyfriend doesn't apply to you directly, but you better pay attention, right? What reappears in all ages, whether it be during the patriarchal law, during the Mosaic law, during the new covenant, if it reappears in all those, you get the idea, this is who God is. What flows out of the nature of God? What has been universally agreed throughout church history as this is what Christians do and believe? Those are all very helpful foundation stones for me in trying to figure out what to do with some of these difficult things in Leviticus. And so keep that in mind because this happens a lot, but especially in an election year. What you'll find is people quoting passages that seem to specifically represent the things that they want to endorse and then conveniently skipping over the next verse. And then the other side will quote the next verse, but not the one that was quoted before. So you'll get passages in Leviticus that seem to have very strong statements about sexual ethics. And one side of the political aisle says, this is God's word and they'll quote Leviticus. And then you'll get somebody on the other side to say, it's interesting how Leviticus talks about how you care for immigrants, foreigners, and give them equal right to locals. In fact, everyone's supposed to take part of what they've got and give it up as a welfare net for everyone in the area, including and especially strangers and foreigners. Leviticus says all of this. Now, what do you do with that? Well, I just told you. None of this is legislation for the church, period. But all of it reflects the heart of God, period. And therefore, we need to ask the harder question, what are we learning about who God is? Now, there's three areas of holiness that God's people are called to in Leviticus 18 through 20. Worship, sex, and justice. Last week, we talked about worship. I want to tackle the other two. I believe... That in any culture, we need to know what is proper love for neighbor, proper love for self, and proper love for God. And sexual ethics hits all three. We mentioned worship last week. It's not a coincidence that in Romans chapter 1, Paul goes from a statement about how the culture of his day has started worshiping the creature rather than the creator. And the very next step he goes to is, and take a look at their love life practices. It's interesting how the two flow together. Is it true that sensuality is still a God? And is it a God for us? Do you think it's a coincidence that of all the gods you've heard of throughout the years, it's fertility gods that get mentioned so often? I would say that it's about as much of a coincidence as the fact that sex is the single most important marker for self-identity in our culture today. And what do you do with that as a Christian? Well, you recognize some things that have been true from the very beginning. When Jesus was asked some interesting and difficult questions about relationships and marriage, he said, I want to remind you 
of what God's ideal was from the very beginning. It turns out that what God has always wanted is a relationship of incredible love shared monogamously between one man and one woman for life. And in Leviticus 20, there's a whole section in which it's very clear what he says is no adultery, no using non-humans, and make sure that it's the opposite sex. This turns out to be the standard in every age of the Bible and was the standard in church history for 1,900 years. And as we progress, the Christian rules get more and more refined. There was a time in the Old Testament when God said things like, don't marry outside of your group. So there was a real problem with these Jewish people who had married into Gentile life. And there's a long story behind that. We'll get into that some other time. But when you get to the New Testament, you'll get the question of, well, can, can, can a Jewish person background marry a Gentile person background? And Paul says, yes, but marry in the Lord. Can, can, can you go back to your first spouse? Deuteronomy says you can't do that. Well, there's nothing in the New Testament that makes me think that that's impossible. But instead, what he says is, you need to ask the question, what is the ultimate goal in mind? When 1 Corinthians is written in chapter 7, deals with all these thorny questions that Jesus never dealt with in the Gospels, and Paul's trying to ferret it all out, he says, look, I'll deal with those interesting questions, but I want you to go back to this question even more important than that. What is your end goal? What are you trying to communicate to the culture around you? What are you saying to your spouse, and what are you saying to your neighbors by how you act? It turns out that your love life is not primarily about you. It's not primarily about liberty. It's not primarily about, about rights. It's not about what my instincts tell me or what my culture tells me. God invented it, so God sets the value. Change the way we think about this. I, wanna, I want you to mark this down. Orthodox Christianity has always maintained that sex was intended only within marriage between one man and one woman for life, that children were to be a primary reason for that union and that Christians would not participate in actions that would denigrate such things. And then when Christians did participate in things that denigrated such things, Paul says Christ will take you where you are, but he won't leave you that way. And then the question about how we deal with human life Christians did not participate in the setting out or exposing or the destroying of their offspring. Children were to be welcomed into life and treated with dignity befitting those made in the image of God. It was seen as part and parcel of the ethics of I don't decide what value is in this area. God decides. But I also find it interesting that when I try to explain to people who are not of a Christian background these particular teachings... I find it most helpful not to start with these ethics. I find it much more helpful to start with who God is and what he's accomplished in Jesus Christ. Do you realize the, the reversed order that we tend to do in which we think what we need to do is go tell our pagan neighbors to change who they're hanging out with? When our, really our goal is to tell our neighbors that God has changed the whole world and can change the way you see yourself and the world. And if God raised Jesus from the dead, well then, we've got some things to reorder in our lives. Sexual ethics is very clear in Scripture. And what Leviticus is getting at is the heart of God. It's also clear that another way in which a community stays holy is to practice justice. This is proper love of neighbor. And justice is not primarily about you. It's not about liberty. It's not about rights. It's not about what my party tells me. In Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 through 18, the text says, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. Do you notice the language about your people? You can see why in the New Testament. 
The starting assumption was your neighbor are people from your own tribe. And so when someone asked Jesus, so who is my neighbor? And Jesus gave an answer that was broader than that. It shocked and offended some. But they weren't reading Leviticus carefully enough. Look in verse 34. Let's start in verse 33. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. For I am the Lord your God. In the Old Testament, justice was about how a ruler treats the powerless, the poor, the oppressed, and the exploited. Psalm 72, David's prayer for his son Solomon, is that he would care about just such people. Look in Proverbs 31, the proverb that Lemuel was taught by his mother. Look in chapter 31, verses 8 through 9, about what it means to be a wise king. Open your mouth for the mute. For the rights of all who are destitute, open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Look in Jeremiah 22, verses 1 through 5. Thus says the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word. Hear the word of the Lord. O king of Judah, who sits on the throne of David, you and your servants... Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who's been robbed and do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless, the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you will indeed obey this word, then there shall enter the gates of this house kings who sit on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses. But if you will not obey these words... I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. How did this work itself out under an old covenant? It worked itself out in such a way that when you would glean the threshing floor, you were supposed to leave grain on the floor behind you. There was even an understanding that you don't build a second house, uh, I'm sorry, a second story on your house until your neighbors were able to build a first story for their house. What we're seeing here is not one-to-one legislation for a democratic country. What we're seeing is the heart of God that challenges our minute, our myopic perspective about what is a just society. Robert George came to Harding last year, and he said something really interesting, powerful, challenging to everyone. He said liberals were wrong in the 20s and 30s when it came to eugenics. Did you know that all of the top Ivy League schools were teaching or practicing this idea of treating people as if they're less than human, doing experiments on people or suggesting how do we thin out the population based on who we think should be a master race or master class. Hitler said he got his ideas from watching us. Robert George says liberals were wrong in the 20s and 30s on what it means to be made in the image of God. And then he said conservatives got it wrong in the civil rights era. Do you realize that when Brown v. Board of Education said it is wrong for schools to say you have to be a certain race to go to school here. My own university said we're gonna continue to do that. The president of the school gave two chapel speeches years after that decision and said we don't do that. And how dare anybody say we should? Bluebirds and blackbirds don't mix together. When did Harding integrate? 1963, what a coincidence it happens to be the year in which the federal government said we won't give you any federal funds unless you do this. Bob Jones University actually said it was against the rules of their university for people of different races to date on campus. You could be kicked out if you did so. George Bush was running for president 
and he gave a speech out there and got bad press. Wouldn't you know it? What a coincidence. They changed their mind. I'm telling you, we've got to pay attention. When God says, I care about sexual ethics, I care about people being made in the image of God, and I care about justice for the exploited and the oppressed, we get myopic. We see things through our lens. We don't see the big picture. Hindsight's 2020. Boy, is it easy to point the finger at former generations. We must be humble enough to recognize that my children will say something about a view that I hold now, 30 years from now, that I just didn't see. Let's read the text with an awareness that God is challenging us in every direction. So what's the motivation for holiness? Why should we seek to be holy in our worship, in our ethics, in our view of the image of God, and in our view of justice? The motivation for ethics is that we want to be like God. A God who made the world, loved the world, cares for the world, and died for the world. Do we care that much for the world? The God who came in the person of Jesus Christ and lived a holy, perfect, sinless life. Do we care that much about the weight of sin and the joy of holy living? We seek to be holy so we can be like God. We seek to be holy to avoid divine judgment. We seek to be holy so that we can live out the blessings of a life. God says, this isn't just required of you. This is for your own good. And we seek to be holy for the good of our neighbors. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, the Bible says, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord our God commanded. You are to keep them and do them in the sight of the people who will surely say, this is a great nation. This is a wise and understanding people. Or as the New Testament puts it in 1 Peter 2, live such good lives before the pagan world that they will glorify God in the day he comes to visit. J.C. Ryle once wrote, we must be holy because this is the best way to do good to others. How you live is a silent sermon that all can read. May we pay attention to our personal ethics. May we pay attention to our church ethics. May we do good and contribute to corporate ethics that reflects the holiness of God. Let's pray. God, we love you and praise your name. We ask you to give us a sense of your holiness. Father, defeat in us that which is wrong. Teach us to follow your ways regardless of how it makes us feel. Father, help us to see the big picture, to be challenged from whatever direction that's the opposite of the way we lean, that we might see through your eyes and be more, be richer, be deeper for it, because your word reflects your heart. Father, may we reflect the character of you and your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh,